well, he, he's our younger student. <laughs> yeah. The very, the very <laughs> youngest. Yeah. He always come out and ask me, Dad, do you want, do you have any trouble? Exactly. <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to help you? <laughs> always. Yes. Or you can say this, uh, I mean, the famous uh, anecdote, if uh, if this question, this question is that easy, that my, even my song will be answering to you. That, so that's the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. But then, uh, you know, uh, the question you see, my song will answer to you. And there is one thing, probably, you know the joke, why, uh, why God has not become a professor. Mm. The re- <laughs> The reason he got only one book, which is published not in English even, right? <laughs> wow. And he got a class of he got a class of students, but whenever the students got a problem, he said, "My son will answer you the questions." Well, yeah, yeah, Christos, you give him an answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The way the way his students were treated not good either. So the first students who are not not obedient is to go out of my classroom and just to the whiteness. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Okay. So uh, should I start now or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, good morning, everyone in, in Austria and good evenings in, in Australia. All right. Um, welcome uh, again to, to my lecture. Um, so yesterday, uh, if you attend my lecture, I have um, presented um, a two-hour lecture on the introduction of SPST geomechanics, focusing on uh, the fundamental concepts. For today's lecture, I'm going to focus more on the applicant si- application side of uh, the SPS methods. And I will mainly uh, presenting to use the capability of what SPS can do to solving some sort of challenging problem. And as usual, before I, I start my, my lecture, I would like to acknowledge um, the contribution of my uh, college, um, is Professor Yang Wen from the University of Adelaide. Uh, he has been working with me for, um, well, we are collaborating with his order uh, since last um, six, seven years uh, and has producing very productive outcome, uh, both in terms of um, research funding, peer supervision and scientific research. Uh, and here, I also would like to acknowledge the contribution of my former and current PhD student uh, who has made significant contribution to, to this talk. Now, this is the, the content of my lecture today. So I'm going to first uh, very quickly uh, to go through um, a review of the SPS methods that I described or explained yesterday. And then I'm going to focus more on the application of SPS and in particular, uh, I will be focusing on three aspects uh, of a soil structure interaction, localized failure and fracture, and finally, if I have time, I will be uh, presenting the couple hydromechanical problem. And I will end my presentation with some conclusion and, and outlook. Now, this is something what I presented yesterday, and this is the, the foundation or the basic SPS formulation uh, which can be used to calculate or to estimate a few variable at um, a given location. What does it mean is, if you are if you want to calculate the few variable at this location represented by the function f, all you need to do is taking the sum of its value at a neighboring particle or neighboring points, multiplying with the volume of its point, weighted with a, a kernel function, and this is the whole idea of the SPS methods. The concept is quite straightforward. So when you are doing this weighting average, you need a kernel function. And this kernel function needs to be satisfied a number of conditions that we discussed yesterday. And keep in mind that there was a quite um, a number of confusion in the literature, uh, which mostly due to the wrong choice of the kernel function. And if you are missing this, um, I would recommend you to go back to my lecture yesterday. Um, and based on this basic SPS formulation, we can um, using the Gaussian theorem to establish 
the gradient of a function um, in SPS, which basically can be calculated by um, the gradient of the kernel function instead of, of a function itself. And again, because of this, we need a kernel function uh, to be uh, a <coughs> continuous or second derivative. Now from here, we can using this um, SPS operator to approximate the governing equation for soy or for geo uh, mechanic application, we basically using the operator here to approximate this spatial gradient. And you need to keep in mind that when you apply the SPS operator to approximate or to criticize this term, uh, sometimes a good SPS operator might become a bad choice. That's what we discussed yesterday. For instance, if you're looking at the, if you're looking at here, um, a three basic SPS formulation, we can be derived based on the foundation formulation. You can see that this equation is not good because it's actually produced a very noise sort of the gradient view approximation. It can be improved by um, taking, removing the error uh, from the Taylor expansion series that what I discussed yesterday, or even completely remove the error as you can see from here to obtain the, um, the high accurate um, uh, 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 approximation up to the second order um, um, accuracy. But the good thing, the problem is for this, what we call a good SPS operator, it can be good for the density and strength approximation, but it's not good for the for the momentum equation uh, because it does not produce the momentum equation that conserves the linear and angular momentum, which is something we discussed yesterday. And for this case, we actually need to use a bad SPS operator to obtain a momentum equation that conserves both linear and angular momentum. And this is, to me, this is quite a beautiful feature of SPS where you can play with a mathematical equation to obtain what you are required for a particular application. So I'm not going to go in depth of this uh, particular question, just some quick review of the key feature of SPS. And now I'm going to focus in more on the, on the application side. Um, now, for here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to more or less presenting some key concept and then showing you the key results that we can achieve with the SPS methods. I will spend a bit more time on this uh, problem where we need a new sort of concept model to describe this problem, which is uh, quite different from the traditional approach that where I will focusing more on the detail. For the rest of the application, I will uh, focusing on the demonstration of the application. Now we start with the uh, soil structure interaction that I call here. So what are the, the challenge? And here, what I'm going to show you, is I'm going to show you two of the, to me, it's quite challenging application um, of soil structure interaction uh, that is not easy to, um, to, to, to investigate by using um, the experimental techniques or uh, some standard numerical methods. For example, in this case here, you see that um, um, this is the, what we call the segmental retaining wall system, um, which basically commonly used to reinforce the slope. This kind of segmental retaining wall system have a size up to even one or 1.5 meter um, width, uh, which is very commonly used in Japan to stabilize the slope would be up to 10 to 15 meter high. The reason is because this kind of the system are uh, very uh, suitable for uh, stabilize the slope under earthquake loading condition because when you have an earthquake loading condition, this sort of the flexible uh, structure can tolerate the displacement and therefore can still stabilize the slope, unlike the, the resist retaining wall system. Um, the design of this system is really challenging, um, especially if you have to conduct the experiments. Just imagine that if you need to and experiments up to 10 to 15 meter high um, to, to, to basically optimize the shape of retaining work. For example, what is the optimal shape uh, and, and things like that would require significant time, effort, and, and money. And as a result, for this type of application, uh, computational modeling uh, would be um, really advantage. Uh, and we also need to uh, use some sort of advanced numerical techniques to uh, which is capable of modeling not only large information, but also the flexible interaction between soil and, and, uh, and the rigid structure. The other uh, high applications are related to what we call the control structure or debris flow control structure. This is an example of debris flow. And to control or to delay this sort of debris flow, what we normally do is we install some sort of thing like a check down system 
or even the buffer system right along this this all channel here just to delay the the speed of the dp flow and again this is this problem are uh, extremely large scale and design the suitable height or the suitable distance requires uh, our um, large scale uh, investigation and um, it's very difficult to uh, conduct uh, the experiment to optimize this whole system and one again this whole problem require a massive some sort of prediction of repeat flow which is not easy to handle by uh, by by the traditional numerical uh, methods and that results these sort of two applications are really challenging for both experiments as well as the um, traditional numerical methods and therefore advanced numerical methods such as um, point bay methods sps mpm uh, or particle finite elements are uh, a good choice so i'm going to show you two of these applications uh, to show the capability of the sps methods now i'll start with the um, the retaining wall system which i uh, name it at the dynamic structure so this is an example and this is um, kind of the uh, the, the motiv motivation of why do we need to use this sort of segmental return ego system uh, it actually has to tolerate the formation and stabilize quite nicely on the slope under earthquake loading condition but the shape the designing the shape is very complicated right so how do we actually doing this so to um simulate this sort of problem what we need to do here is we using a very conventional um Goldman equation, which I discussed yesterday, consisting of the mass and momentum conservation equation. And we also need a constant model, a standard constant model to describe the soil behavior. Now, the key sort of the thing that we need to consider in this sort of uh, application is to model the rigid body motion of this uh, solid body and to model how they actually interact with the soil or how the rigid body interact with each other. This is the key consideration. Within the SPS, this sort of rigid body can be modeled using uh, what we actually call the Bowery particle. And this work was published in 2014. So in this approach, what we did was we using a set of what we call Bowery particle to represent the solid body. Right? The number of Bowery particle here need to be considered later. And because we are using the Bowery particle and as a result, we can actually model any complex complicated shape of the of the solid body and then what next is we need to describe the motion of the rigid body right so here for each rigid body we have the central mass which is we can actually using the translational motion equation and the rotational motion equation to describe the motion of the rigid body z here right and in this equation here you have v is the velocity omega is the rotational velocity this R is the, the, the coordinates of the center of, of the gravity mass. And this small R here, normal R here, is the basically coordinate of the Bowery particle. So this equation is nothing but a Newton second law, right? And once if you solve this equation, uh, you're getting the velocity of central mass and the rotational velocity of the central mass. You can use this velocity to update the motion of the Bowery particle here following this equation. So it's quite straightforward, right? And for soil, we can use the traditional approach. And the key idea in this application is now to formulate the interaction force. How we actually modeling the interaction force between soil and the block or rigid body, or between the rigid body. This is the key idea. And this is required because you need to using this sort of the interaction force to advance the motion of the particle uh, or of the rigid body. So now I'm going to focusing on how we actually formulating the contact model. Now, if you're looking at the, this is the, um, one of the simplest way to model interaction force is to basically using what we call a spring and dashboard system. Now, if you are working with the discrete element methods, then you see that this sort of the um, force contact model can be well suitable uh, to adopt it here. And basically what we're doing here is we, employing this contact model to describe the interaction between soil and the um, particle on the on the uh, rigid body and similarly the interaction for is also applied to describe interaction between two blocks and here is how we model um, the forces acting on uh, on the block due to soil or the force acting on soil particle due to the block 
And this one is basically the first component represent the spring force and the second component here are simply represent the damping force. Um, this is the conventional sort of the penalty force approach or DM approach. Now, what happening here is when you're representing the block, you would need a number of um, boundary particle. And the problem is the more boundary particle you are using, the force acting on, on the block will be scaled with the number of particles you are actually using to represent the block. And therefore, to accurately calculate the force acting on the blocks due to the soil, you need to normalize this force with the number of uh, contact point per solid body. Okay, this is the key idea or sort of the key approach we need to take into consideration or to, 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 um, to keep in mind when we using the boundary particle here to represent a rigid body in SPS. Now for a shear force, we are um, limiting the shear force following the more column friction uh, coefficient. So this is a quite straightforward approach. Now let's see how does it work. What we're going to do here is we're going to show you the results. So what I did here is to check this formulation with basically the normal line of the contact force that I proposed. And what we did was we consider this block, right? And then we drop the block from a certain height. Uh, and then we, um, we, we, we using an analytical solution to, um, to describe the, the kinematic or the motion of this block. And then we're using the same approach as this to model the block. Uh, and then we compare the solution with the analytical solution. And you can see from here that this is the result um, without normalized uh, with the number of contact points. And you can see that the more particle, the more particle we are using to represent the rigid body, um, the uh, more energy dissipation you are actually seeing from, from this result. Or in other words, the kinematics of the block, uh, motion of the block chain with the number of particles using to represent the block. But on the other hand, if you are normalized this contact force um, with uh, the number of contact points, then you can actually obtain the converse solution like what you can see right here. And this is the test for um, the bouncing uh, problem. So this test suggesting that the uh, penalty force needs to normalize with the, with the number of particles that are used to represent the rigid body. Now, moving to the, uh, we also, and uh, keep in mind here that for this test, we're only testing with, with a given, um, what we call the coefficient of restitution, which can be used to calculate the, the damping coefficient here. And we are only testing here with one particular coefficient of restitution. Now, we're also checking the model with different coefficient of restitution, uh, E, and you can see that, again, the computational model can be uh, predict very well um, the theoretical solution. We're giving out the confidence that for a normal uh, context, um, this formulation can be used to describe the, the motion of the block. Uh, so how about a shear? So we're also using this for the shear components where we actually uh, test again an analytical solution by again consider block and then apply the initial velocity of V0 and then see when actually how far this block move and when they actually stop. Uh, and then we're using the same approach um, um, to model by, by SPS. And this is the comparison between uh, the analytical solution and numerical simulation. We're showing that, that the shear force is also need to scale with a number of the, uh, of the contact points. Um, this is a very important uh, sort of consideration that we need to consider. So now, based on this, we are having a confidence to, uh, to test our model again experiments. And to do this, what we did was we conduct a very simple plan strength um, experiments and using what we call aluminum bar uh, material. So this aluminum bar rod is something like, like that, okay? That's uh, basically to represent the 2D condition. So here we consider a number of um, blocks. Uh, and then what we did here was at, at the beginning, we um, reinforced the, we stopped the block here um, by the stopper. Uh, and then we build up the soil door, um, the soil domain here. And then we quickly remove this, um, this stopper uh, just let the, the block to slide down and then measure the dynamic of this three tangible block. To provide, uh, uh, to obtain the experimental data for this sort of test, we conduct the, uh, the direct set test for this soil, um, direct set test for this soil to obtain um, the friction uh, coefficient. We also conduct this sort of basic test to obtain the coefficient 
friction coefficient interface friction coefficient between the block or between the block and the sort right so this is the I just quickly give you the the idea of, of the experiment this is the, the how the block actually collapsed uh, in the experiment uh, and we actually measuring uh, the the displacement of this block to compare with the uh, with experiment and also the deformation of pattern of this in this granular material and this is the prediction and here you have the um, on this here you have experimental data um, results and here you have a simulation results and you can see that the um, the, the, the simulation can predict very well what happened in in the experiments and again if you're looking at the uh, the kinematics of the granular flow we were able to capture quite nice this sort of the uh, problem using a very simple approach and one again keep in mind that for this case here, um, we if you want to know how we model this of granular material using SPS, then you can go back to my lecture yesterday. So we also looking at the um, the kinematic of this. Um, so we conduct actually a number of, of experiments to 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 measure the mobility of each block. So we have block one, two, three, uh, basically named here, uh, and we conduct a number of tests to see what is the range of displacement. Um, for each block, and then we compare this with our numerical solution, uh, and it's fairly good agreement was was achieved. Now, what ends actually we subsequently we using this model um, to work with the uh, with a uh, industry company who basically we deliver a computer model for them to um, to to design their mechanical system. But I was not allowed to present that result. But what I can show you here is a quite interesting application. Uh, some of, of of the result that not relevant to their work. This is an example of how you actually using a segmental retaining wall system to reinforce a slope, right? So here you're having a slope without any reinforcement. And on the right hand side that you see that when you're using uh, a retaining wall block to reinforce the slope, the, the retaining wall block have to stabilize the slope, but only up to a certain height. If you keep increasing the height of the, of the retaining wall uh, block, then it actually eventually collapse. We can also using the same approach to, to, to change the shape of the retaining wall block. Like this week we have done uh, previously and then uh, optimize the shape of the block right here using the same approach. And this is quite one of the quite interesting application that we have been successful in the past. Now, um, moving to the other type of application within the soil structure interaction is the, the control structure that I discussed earlier. So this, for this particular case, we don't have to deal with the dynamics motion of the retaining wall block, but more or less we're looking at how the debris flow interacting with the with the control structure system, right? So for the debris flow control structure uh, system, we have two type of uh, typically we have two type of the control structure. We can have uh, either check down system, uh, which are, I believe is commonly used in Europe, and we having the other type of the buffer system. Right. For a check down system, you're using the, the dam with, with that dimension like that, okay, to actually prevent the, uh, the um, to delay the <coughs> mobility of the DP flow. For a check down system, for a buffer flow using some sort of the, the column of the, the concrete column like what we have here, and this is how they actually install the, uh, the buffer, buffer system in, in Hong Kong. They can either install down slope or they can either install before the rigid barrier, like what you can see from here, just to delay uh, the speed of the DP flow before the impact to the rigid body, uh, rigid barrier, or before the impact to the infrastructure. So what we did here is um, obviously this sort of the uh, the application would require significant time efforts to investigate uh, the problem using experiment um, um, research. And in fact, um, one of the group in Hong Kong uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology now trying to, to, to conduct a very large scale experiment uh, to investigate or to optimize the shape or the, uh, the location or the, the distance uh, of this buffer system using a few scale test up to 20 meter high and so on. Uh, and we had the opportunity to collaborate with them. So I'm going to show some of the results that we, uh, we, we have been working with them. So what we do here is that group was in Hong Kong was uh, led by uh, Claren Choice and Chuck Ng uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. They has been uh, intensively uh, doing the research in optimizing the 
um, the buffer system. Right? This is the, uh, the, the, the experimental uh, test or data conducted at Hong Kong University of Science Technology. <clears throat> and here is the deep blood channel, uh, deep rich uh, channels. And this is the location where they actually install. This is the, so the buffer system. And what they're doing here is they um, change the way they rearrange the, the buffer system and see what is the optimal optimized um, sort of the design. Um, so we actually obtain um, the, uh, they're giving us data and, and we're testing our SPS model. So for SPS simulation of this particular problem, um, which is basically the brief flow, uh, what we're doing is we're using the same SPS global equation we consist of the mass conservation equation and the momentum conservation equation we discussed yesterday. Uh, for this type of DB flow, um, we are prefer to using the regular G model. And here we're using uh, um, the Bingham fluid model instead of the, the mu i model. Uh, we plan, we having option to using the mu i model, <clears throat> but the problem is the mu i model have a lot of, um, um, of um, uh, constant parameter. We, we don't have the, uh, experimental data to calibrate and therefore we adopted here a very simple regular G model with link to the um, to the shear strength of material through the more column um, yielding criteria which is basically tau f equal to c plus tangent phi so with the brief flow c equal to zero so we need to actually find out the friction angle for this sort of the, uh, application so for the buffer what we're doing here for the buffer we um, we model the buffer using a rigid boundary particle. This is something I discussed yesterday. So we're using a, a, a fixed particle uh, to represent the buffer here. Uh, and then we impose the no slip boundary condition uh, to this buffer. So this is something we did previously. And this work was conducted by uh, my current um, postgraduate student who had done some excellent work in, uh, in, the, in the large scale application of SPS. Now let's see how we actually um, model this problem. And you can see this is an example. We first we we try to set up the simulation to see how stable uh, the SPS model can predict this sort of problem. And what you can see from here is uh, the comparison between uh, the SPS model with n and without buffer. And you can see very clear that how effective the buffer uh, system have to delay the debris flows, right? And look like it seems that we actually be able to capture the experimental um, data here but we don't actually stop here we go further by uh, context um, um, current and choice and network and getting the data from them uh, and further validate our model this is the validation process sorry so what we did was uh, they're giving us the data uh, which basically um, the um, experimental data consists of the um, flow with buffer and without buffer, right? So this is the experimental data without buffer. So basically, they remove the buffer. They're having the initial volume of the uh, granular material, and they just let up to flow, flow out uh, downstream. And then the other result are uh, with the buffer. So what we did in our test was, because they actually uh, did not uh, provide uh, enough information, and therefore we need to calibrate our experimental data. data. And this is quite interesting um, sort of the, the thing we often encounter in, um, in, 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 in computational modeling. We can have a lot of experimental data in the literature, but most of the data are actually missing the required parameter for computational model. And as a result, we always have to find a way to calibrate our currency parameter for those applications. And this case is not exception. What we're doing here is, we calibrate our constant parameter with basically the friction angle for the runner flow with our buffer. And this is that our calibration, right? So this is the uh, upstream flow depth, which is measured at this particular location. And this is the flow depth. With our buffer, we fine tuning our parameter uh, to obtain the friction coefficient. And we found that our friction coefficient are close, very close to the the range of friction coefficient of the material that we're using in this test. And then we're using this parameter to predict the experimental data with buffer. And we was able to capture quite um, close the final runout distance, which actually at this location uh, at, the, at the downstream and uh, qual quantitatively capture the, um, the flow depth 
at this particular location when you have the buffer in place. And this is the kinematics of the flow we are predict uh, in comparison with the experiment. And you can see from here, we are using as really quite um, a simple currency model, but we can still capture quite nice um, the, the result and the kinematic of the flow, like what you can see uh, from this, this data. <clears throat> what we can do from here, perhaps, is to looking at, if you're looking at the experimental data right here, you can see that the granular material actually undergoing the gaseous stage where our currency model does not include any gaseous state. So in order to capture this sort of behavior, we need to include advanced currency model. With a currency model that requires only one parameter of, of the, of the uh, friction coefficient, um, we, we don't actually expect that much. And this is quite good results in our view. <clears throat> now, what you can do here is, you can see based on this, we start looking at how we can actually using this numerical simulation to investigate the mechanism of the brief flow through um, the buffer or through different control structure. And here we investigate three different control structure where we're looking at first, we having uh, a short uh, buffer system. And here we have a taller buffer system. And this one, we have the check dam system, right? This is the, 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 the three different system we are investigating. And you can see from here, quite nicely that with the numerical simulation, you can actually predict precisely, you can predict what is the force acting on each buffer system. And the result makes sense here where the force actually reaching the peak value for the first row and reduce for a subsequent row. And here we can see the impact of the different um, um, buffer system when they have different height. For example, when you're using the shorter buffer system, you experience some sort of overflow mechanism, right? But on the other hand, with the total buffer system, you don't have this mechanism. And what is the implication of this? If you're looking at the result that we see here, you're looking at the force acting on the buffer. You can see that if you are using a short buffer system, the big force actually um, occur right at the impacts of the flow to the buffer system. On the other hand, for the taller buffer system, the big force actually occur after the flow impacting <clears throat> the, the buffer, which makes sense because these taller systems are, are more effective in in, in delaying the debris flow and therefore the peak force actually uh, could occur subsequently when the, the flow actually arriving the, the buffer system. Now further from this, what we can do is we can looking at the, for comparing to the uh, comparison between the uh, buffer system and the check down system, as you can see from here, and very clear from this comparison that the check down system appear to be more effective in terms of uh, delaying the debris flows, right? And here, when you compare between the short and taller buffer system, the taller, buff taller buffer system is actually better to delaying the debris flow compared to the shorter. The check dam system appears to be the most effective system. However, if you compare the force acting on the check dam system as compared to the force acting on the on the buffer system, you see that the force acting on the check down system here is actually one order of magnitudes as compared to the force acting on the, on the check down system. Meaning that even though this check down system uh, can actually um, quite effective in terms of delaying the debris flow, the design of this check down system uh, could require significant force or reinforcement to make sure the structure are stable. Okay, so this is one of the uh, quite interesting um, um, uh, finding. The other interesting finding that we are also looking at here is in terms of um, design aspect. When you are design this sort of the um, the control structure, what we uh, conventionally we normally looking at the energy dissipation, but this is actually not the case when you design the control system. If you're looking at the the result that we are actually reported here, you can see that. Now this is the case where you have no control system, and which showing that the total energy dissipation is maximum for the system, for the uh, the K without any control structure. On the other hand, when you start implement a control structure, the total energy dissipation is less. So at the results, 
very clear that we should not be using this of total energy dissipation mechanism to design or to decide which one is effective in terms of the control structure. But instead, if you're looking at different sort of the mechanism of PB flow, for example, you're looking at the kinematics energy of the, of the flow, you see that the, uh, it's appear from here that the kinematics flow of the, um, the case with buffer or with check dam showing the dramatic decrease or drop of the kinematic um, energy after impacting with the, with the control structure. So this seems to be uh, an effective measure we can be used to design the control structure or similarly for a potential energy with the control structure, the potential energy seems to be less degree compared to the, uh, the system without uh, control system. Alternative to this kinematic energy, we can also using some sort of what you call the flow rate uh, measuring at some given location after the control structure. And you can see also from here that with the uh, control structure, and there is a dramatic flow rate after the structure. Uh, and obviously either flow rate and the kinematic energy or potential energies can be used to add kind of the, um, the indicator uh, for to design the effective the total energy dissipation. So this is a quite interesting outcome. Uh, and this work was submitted to uh, Acta and Geotechnica and is still under, under um, reviews at the moment. Um, further from it, what we can do is um, this, we have not actually um, um, go in deep, but this is just show you what is the capability of our model, uh, for instance. So here, well, the work was again done by uh, Edward. Um, he have um, using our um, um, parallel computing course to set up this simulation to simulate the bridge flow through the multiple structure. And you can see that um, the SPS methods are highly suitable for this sort of complex problem, uh, requires um, um, uh, interesting application if you're looking at the multiple control structure, or we can even go a bit more by looking at uh, a very complex problem uh, with more control structure here. This again, this, this, this test involves millions of particles uh, conducted using our high performance computing code. So this is just to show you the capability of what you can do with, uh, with the SPS methods in terms of soil structure interaction. And I'm not going to, uh, to go into detail on, on this application <coughs> further. All right, so that is the, uh, the first application of the soil structure interaction, which show you some capability of SPA to model the dynamic structure interaction and the interaction between the bridge flow and the control structure system. Now I'm going to move to on the localized failure and fracturing, uh, fracturing problem. This is one of the uh, complex problems that I believe not easy to handle uh, both in terms of the uh, traditional numerical methods and, and the particle point methods. So what is the, uh, the challenge in dealing with this uh, problem? Now, if you're looking at the, the failure of the material at the fuel scale, right? And you can see very clearly that the failure at the fuel scale was actually started at the most lower scale, right? At the um, RV scale or even grand scale, be controlled by eventually the interaction between grain particle right here. And very clear that if you want, it's all put due to the significant difference in the scale, right? Micrometer to, to hundred of meter here. It's impossible to bring this grand scale to the fuel scale. And as a result, what we normally do is we formulate a constant model at this RBE scale. So this is the way we are normally this. And we has been very successful in formulating the constant model at this intermediate scale, we call RBE scale. And we have been also very successfully to fitting our concept model to existing experimental data. And this data here show you very clear of how well we can fit our concept model into the existing experimental data. The problem is this sort of the fitting nature can only correct or only suitable for a given scale. When you change the different scale or when you change the sample size, you need to fit the model again, right? And this raising a question how are you actually going to using this concept model in a few scale where you could have a significant large uh, RVE, uh, which is totally different from what you calibrate from, from the, the experiment. And what is the basically um, the, 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 the key cause or the main reason causing this difference? Or why do we having this sort of problem? Why do we having the issue 
that when you're changing the sign of the IVE, you get different behavior. And I believe that the reason that we cannot capture this sort of mechanism was because we're missing some of the key components. And this was the work actually initiated by, by my colleague, um, uh, Jiang Wen from the University of Adelaide, who actually pointed out that existing currency model here were actually missing a very key component. And as a result, they are unable to capture um, the, um, the currency response when you change the different scale. What happening here is if you're looking at the IVE, this is a, a very typical um, trial test. And you can see that in the trial test, when you're loading uh, the, tri uh, the the spaceman, um, at some point you would see this localization band occur within the soil spaceman, right? And because of this localization band, what you can see is that the material within this RVE, the material actually separate into the material inside the localization band and the material outside the localization band, which is this area. And very clear that you can see that the material inside this localizing zone will undergo successive deformation compared to the material inside, we can either undergo unloading or um, um, smaller um, deformation, right? And very clear that all of the existing concept model here are missing this key sort of scale, which we call a meso scale, right? And as a result, they are failed to capture the side dependent behavior. And for this, if we really want to bring our existing concept model to the few scale application, we need a new concept framework that take into account this what we call meso scale. All right. So how we do that? I'm going to show you this concept shortly. In addition to this, if you're looking at the problem that we are dealing with, for example, if you want to simulate this slope right, at a few scale, and obviously it can be meters or a uh, thousand meters and so on. In terms of computational model, In the continuum framework, what we normally do is first we need to make some assumption or idealization, right? Using the continuum methods. For example, here we idealize this slope at a, a homogeneous slope, like what we have here, right? And then we're using a suitable numerical methods. For example, we're using the SPF methods to decrease design the computational domains, right? And here we can using um, so of the SPS particle to discrete design this domain. And keep in mind that this is a SPS is continuum methods. Each of the particle here will carry uh, a certain volume and a few variable associated with this volume, right? Now, what next is, if you're looking at the, the problem here, you see that we're actually having uh, the, 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 the failure, right? The localized failure or slow failure. So you want to, you want to predict this problem, you need to, to simulate the failure as well. And very clear that, this failure here is actually um, occurred at a much lower scale, right? So basically, if you're looking at uh, an RVE at this particular location or along the shear band, you're actually seeing this sort of behavior. And this sort of behavior is actually at a very small scale, right? At a millimeter scale or at a laboratory scale. The problem is if you want to capture this sort of the localization band, then you would need to have a very fine mass or the resolution here need to be sufficiently small, smaller than the mass size of this guy in order to correctly capture this localization band. That obviously impossible when you move into the field scale, right? So very clear that in the field scale, there's too much detail, you can't capture everything. <clears throat> If we want to use existing currency model, we need to upscale the currency model. We need to find some sort of mechanism to confidently using the existing currency model that is developed or calibrated at the labs and bring to the fields, right? And also we need a sufficiently small mass, much smaller than this size of the, of the band in order to correctly capture the failure band uh, in, the, in the model. Obviously this is impossible, right? When you're moving to the field scale, all of these are are impossible, right? So what we can do, <clears throat> what we can do here is we can actually come up with a better approach. So imagine that now you don't need to use a very fine mesh to capture this. Now you can actually define some sort of the concept model or an RVE. We carry this band, right? Or we feature this band behavior, right? If that is the case, then you don't actually need to use a very fine mesh 
to capture this localization band because this RV itself already capturing this mechanism, right? And if that is the case, what we can do next is we can using this RV here to actually replace um, to more to, to, to replace the SPS particle. Or in other words, this SPS particle now, regardless of the sign, can carry this RV, which basically is carry a localizing band. And now what we can do is we can model this failure by one RVE here, which is basically carry out this localization band. Or we can model this failure by using one SPS particle that carry a localization band. So this is the key idea and why we need to be using this sort of a new currency framework, a new currency model. <clears throat> I hope I make that clear. <clears throat> now, so how do we actually develop? Obviously, starting from here, all we need to do now is we need to establish a constant model for this sort of RV. Because keep in mind that at the moment, or existing concept model, we're actually using a homogeneous RV. We don't have an existing concept model that um, incorporates this localizing bar. So now we need to establish a concept model for this new RV that we just discussed, okay? So what we're doing here is, all right, I'm going to show you how we're going to to, to establish that concept model. Now for this case, once you actually agree with the concept we just discussed, basically one SPS particle will carry um, um, a localizing band or should actually represent a representative volume element with possessing a, um, a localizing band. Then all we need to do is we follow the conventional approach where we actually still using the governing equation which consists of the density and uh, mass conservation and momentum conservation equation, where now we need a new constant model for stress tensor, we can be actually required here. We now we're going to establish uh, a constant model for this particular RBE system, okay? So this is the, the framework. Uh, and this sort of concept was uh, originally uh, proposed by my college, um, you know, Professor Liang Wen from University of Adelaide. Um, in early 2012, 2014, and then secondly, we have uh, worked together to expanding this concept for uh, more advanced some sort of the localized failure. So the key idea is here. This is the, um, again, this is the, um, the triaxial test that you can, um, uh, that was conducted by um, ACP and Stu in 2000. And you can see from here, this is the two distinct uh, state of deformation. At the beginning of the trisole loading condition, you see that the RVE here are actually uh, undergo more or less homogeneous deformation across the, uh, the RVE, right? Or the, uh, the experimental specimen um, basically featuring the more or less homogeneous deformation. But up to a certain loading point, you see that you start seeing the localization band that develop within the specimen, which basically uh, differentiates the element or separate the element into two different or two different zones that have inside the localizing bone where you're having successive deformation and the outside localizing zone when you have unloading condition. We have actually uh, conduct some tests to prove that the material outside actually undergo unloading during the, the localization deform, deformation process. Now, based on this physical observation of the experiment, what we're doing now is we're going to define a new RVE that is basically representing this element. But before that, what you can still see here is, if you're looking at, this is, the, uh, this is the, the deformation process, right? And if you're looking at the, um, the load displacement, you can see that before the localization or curve, you have actually a unique, some sort of the stress strain relationship for the entire RV, because the deformation are still more or less homogeneous with meaning that existing currency model can still validate up to this point, up to the bifurcation point, where the deformation are more or less homogeneous. But when you actually go beyond this point, right, when you start seeing the, the localization bond to develop, and you will, what you will see here is that the material outside the localizing zone will undergo unloading process, while the material inside the localizing zone will keep undergoing the deformation or localized deformation. Right. What we actually measure in the experiment is the boundary value problem at this location is actually the combination of the, the outside and, and, and inside response. 
which actually giving us the average response. This is the, the macro response, okay? So this is the, the sort of the physical uh, mechanism we observe and we have uh, several tests conducted to prove this, this observation. Now, what we need to do now is we need to having uh, a constant model that capturing this sort of mechanism, right? So what we're doing now is, okay, we, based on the experimental observation that we are seeing here, we're going to define a new, some sort of the um, representative volume element. And keep in mind that in the traditional concept model, the RVE are actually homogeneous. Now, what we do, what we're doing here is we go a step further by assuming that a RVE, the RVE here, are now crossed by a localizing band, which is this guy here. Okay, so that is the key idea. The new RVE now actually consists of the localizing band, which actually having um, a, a thickness. I represent the thickness of the, of the localizing band and also have the, the orientation which represent the orientation of the of a localizing band. And based on this assumption, what we can do further is we can actually separate. Uh, if you're accepting this, this assumption, which is basically correct because we actually replicate the physical experiment. Now, what we can do further from here is we can separate the behavior of the, of the IV we defined. The behavior can be now separate into the behavior of the material outside only, where we have the homogeneous material. And because the behavior outside here are homogeneous, we can use uh, our conventional concept model to represent the behavior of the outside material. And for the inside material, we can also separate um, the behavior of, of the inside material. And also be, the inside material here can be, can be assumed to be homogeneous and that the result we can represent it by using a conventional concept model, right? <clears throat> and what we're doing here is then we formulate um, what we have. We have a concept model for the inside material. We have a concept model for the inside, uh, for outside material, right? And then what we can do next is we can actually combine. We need to find a way to actually combine these two together to represent the mechanism that we discussed before, okay? So how does it work? What we're doing here is all right, start from this, start from the RVE we discussed earlier, and this is the new RVE we established, which consists of a, a cross by a, a, a localization bar. What we're doing here is first, we have to, we need to define the, uh, we need to uh, define the macro strain. Now, previously, if the RVE are homogeneous, then you have only have, you only have one strain component. Now, the RVE consists of the material inside and outside the localizing zone, and therefore, the macro strain we assume here is the average or the volume average of strain outside and the strain inside, which is basically here, where this is the volume fraction of, of each component uh, of, the, of the RVE. <clears throat> and then what we need here is we need the, um, the strain inside the localizing zone and where we're actually using uh, a very sort of a standard approach, kind of the enrichment that is commonly used in, in the literature to uh, to calculate or uh, to link um, the, um, the, the, the strain inside the localizing zone. <clears throat> so what we have here is based on this assumption, we have the stress-strain relationship for the outside material. We have the stress-strain relationship for the inside material, all of which, uh, each of which I assume to be homogeneous. We have the kinematic enrichment for the strain outside and the inside. What we need to do now is we need to actually establish a governing equation for the macro or for the entire element, which is the, the macro stress. The macro stress are basically the average stress of the new RVE that we have just defined, okay? Now, so how can we do? This is how we connect. This is on the, the sort of assumption or condition we discussed earlier. We have the um, uh, kinematic enrichment um, and we have the assume of the a volume average of strain, all of this has been commonly used in, in existing numerical methods. So this is a very common approach. But how we are connecting them is actually the problem. So what we're doing here is we start by, by uh, if you're having the RVE, right? We're having the material inside and material outside. What you can do here is we can impose the human day condition, which basically telling you that the work carried by the entire RVE needs to be balanced with the work carried by the material inside, outside, and the 
And then for the material outside, the localization zone, we have the uh, its own currency model following the traditional currency model. For a material inside the localizing zone, we are also using um, either same or different currency model following the, the traditional approach. And here, if we combine these three conditions together, what we can do is we can actually uh, obtain automatically dry this sort of the, um, the, uh, the condition where it, you can see, looking at this one here, you can see that this condition is actually telling you that um, this sort of the human death condition automatically results in the, the continuity of the stress across the interface. It is because this is the, uh, the stress inside and uh, outside the localizing zone multiplied with the normal vector giving you the stress um, at this, uh, giving you the traction uh, at this location and the stress inside multiplied with the normal vector giving you the traction inside. And this equals zero, meaning that the condition is automatically satisfied. And here we have the macro stress, which again, the average stress of, of these two components. And all of these are actually come naturally from this um, human death condition that we impose, okay? And from here, we actually uh, can derive a general constant model. And this is the relationship between stress and strain. And here are uh, its typic matrix. And you can see from here that this steeply matrix now consists of the steeply matrix of the material outside, the material inside, the volume fraction of the localizing zone, and the Sherman thickness. And because of this, the, our model are actually um, automatically uh, capture the side dependent behavior. And I'm going to show you how they're actually capturing this behavior. Now, moving to how about the computational aspect, um, which means the stress return mapping and algorithm. So all we have, this is the the example of the of the model is of the particle here is actually carry out um, a RVE or an RVE that have um, a, a, a localization zone. <clears throat> and what we do is we're starting from strain, right? This is the deformation here, giving us a velocity which allow us to calculate strain. Now starting from here, strain will allow us to actually calculate stress. And based on stress, we actually can check to see whether we actually uh, have a localized failure or not. And here we're using the rise and and Rodnicki criteria to check this condition. And what we can do next is if the localization occurs, then we can actually uh, using the condition to, uh, to work out the displacement term across the localization zone. And from a displacement term, we can collect and can back calculate the, um, the strain uh, increments outside and inside uh, of the localization zones. And starting from here, we can um, work out what is the stress inside, the stress <laughs> outside. Oh. Uh, somebody, uh, can, uh, uh, can somebody please mute yourself? I still see hear some background noise. Uh, okay, now I continue here. So now you can see um, from the displacement term, we can calculate the strain increment um, outside the localizing zone and strain increment inside the localizing zone. And this allows us to calculate <coughs> the strain increment for outside the localizing zone and the strain increment uh, inside the localizing zone. And once we're having these two components of stress, we need to um, undergo the iteration to ensure that we satisfy the traction continuity condition across this um, um, this um, localization zone. And from here, once this satisfied, we actually can, can obtain the, um, the, the, the macro stress, which is basically the volume average here. Uh, of, oh, sorry, we obtain from the human day condition, um, uh, the average between the, the, the outside and inside stress, which we work out from uh, the earlier iteration. <clears throat> and this is the procedure. Now let's see how the model works, okay? Now to, test the capability of the model. Uh, to test the capability of model, what we're doing here is we, um, we conduct the, um, the, the, the test at the constant level or at the material point. And we assume the material outside are uh, uh, basically elastic behavior and the material inside the localizing zone following the elastics and then plastic softening um, um, with the volume test new criteria that we discussed here. And then we load the elements, right? We load the element. And this is the, the result that you can obtain. And you can see here is the macro stress strain relationship. And you can see that before, when you're actually changing the 
uh, the thickness of the localizing band, how can the model scale with this, um, this um, uh, localization zone? Which is correct because the smaller uh, sort of the shear band thickness, the less energy dissipation you would have, and therefore you have the more brittle material behavior. On the other hand, if the shear band thickness actually saturates the specimen, you will see that our concept model actually return to the classical concept model with featuring no localizing zone. And this is quite a nice feature uh, which automatically converts to the traditional concept model. And if you're looking at the material behave outside the localizing zone, you can see now that our formulation actually uh, re uh, represent what we are uh, intended. Uh, for instance, here, when you're loading the material, they start by undergo elastic deformation. And then up to, upon this point, they actually... <laughs> <laughs> I can't continue with this um, with this background noise. Oh. Okay. I. Professor Pui. I, I, I Professor Pui, you. you can you can mute all the people. All right. Um. Okay. So this is the material outside the localized zone. Uh, it which is actually undergo unloading. Um, uh, behavior, which is expected outcome. And uh, if you're looking at the material inside the localizing zone, you see that upon reaching the bifurcation, bifurcation point, they actually continue undergoing the, um, the, the loading process, which is what we actually intended to do. <clears throat> so basically, the constant model at the material point or at the constant model follow exactly what we are, uh, we are formulated. Now, let's see how does it work here in terms of capturing the finite element solution. So what we're doing here is we're using the finite element methods to simulate the strand localization for three different some sort of specimen size, right? This is the very uh, high tone specimen size, uh, and this is shorter, and this is even shorter, right? And we're also using a consistent mass to make sure we actually produce the consistent shear band um, in, inside the three specimen. And then we measure uh, the macro stress strand relationship. And very clear at this point, before the localization uh, occurs, you obtain uh, a consistent stress strain relationship, which is correct, right? But as soon as you actually having the localization band developed, the uh, response of the material scale uh, with, a with a different size, right? This is the expected outcome uh, in the finite element solution. Now, if you're looking at, if you simulate this problem here, you need to use a very small mass in FEM in order to capture this shear band thickness. And this would take several hours to actually complete this simulation, right? So this is the FEM result. So what we're we doing now is we actually using this numerical simulation as a, a experimental data and to provide information for our concept model. So what we do is we, we're using the, we're measuring the, um, the shear band thickness in the obtained from FEM solution, uh, which is uh, given here. And then we also uh, add an input for a concept model, uh, which is the thickness. And we also taking uh, the length scale of the elements uh, to actually fitting for a concept model. And we actually using the concept model trying to predict this behavior here, okay? So what you can see here is this is the, our prediction at the constitutive level. This is the prediction at the constitutive level. And you can see very clear that we actually, with our new constant modeling approach, just take out a few minutes to actually capturing the entire localization process does occur in a finite element methods for several hours. What does that mean from this? This means that now, if you want to capture the localization zone, you don't need actually to use a very fine mass to simulate this band development. Well, what we can do is we using we can use our constant model, which processing the localization band, and using this for the few scale application as the key idea. Okay, this actually have to avoid the requirement of a very fine mass um, in the few scale application. All right, so that is uh, uh, the application. And here actually, when you the other advantage of this constant model is the capability to actually produce mass independent solutions. For example, in this case here, what we did is we actually um, using our constant model to simulate the shear band development in, in the three different simulation 
with different mesh resolution, right? We have the coarse mesh, medium, and fine mesh. This is the FEM simulation, right? And this is the result that we actually uh, predicted. First, we start with a load displacement relationship. And you can see here, if you are using the constant model without this uh, localized band, then you actually seeing that your constant model scale with the with the mass resolution, which is incorrect, right? But on the other hand, if you are using the constant model that we developed here, our constant model actually produce consistent result regardless of the of the mass element, right? So this is the key feature of the of the model. And then if you're looking at the shear band development, you see that this is the result predicted by the traditional or conditional um, classical approach without the localization band uh, um, embedded in the, in the RVE. And you can see that you're actually having a different shear band orientation and different thickness, right? But on the other hand, if you're using our constant model here, we obtain very consistent shear band orientation and the shear band thickness, right? The problem here, keep in mind what we have here, we're actually having uh, this different in thickness was actually due to the visualization effect or is caused by the plot where uh, we actually represent the localizing band on the entire elements, meaning that when you actually increase the element size, then the, the seven look thicker, but actually not right, in, in reality. So we still work out how to actually uh, improve the way to present uh, this sort of localizing band. In our result, if we plot this data correctly, we should get exactly the same seven thickness for every simulation. So what I want mean here is this of different here are mainly due to the visualization effect or the plotting, the effect of the plotting result. Okay. So this is um, this is a couple of the, the 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 demonstration showing you that the post scale approach uh, or the constant model that processing the localizing one band is uh, essential uh, for the fuel scale application. Because this using this optimal model, when you go to fuel scale, you don't need to use a very fine, a very fine mesh to capture the localized band. This concept model itself already possess this localized band mechanism, and therefore we can use very coarse mesh for the fuel scale application. And also the concept model can be scaled um, 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 from the lab to the field. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you some of the application of this concept that we have achieved, not on the um, the, 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 so, the the so of the uh, localized deform uh, deformation of soil, but more on the fracture problem. Okay, so what we're doing here is when we're moving to the fracture problem, uh, what we can do is we can do exactly the same process. Now we're having a continuum sort of the domain, we're having some sort of uh, fracture. Uh, or cracking um, line here. And if you want to model this sort of the problem by, by SPS, you can using a particle with different resolution and you can do the same concept of the concept model. But now, instead of having what you call previously is the localization band, now each of RVE here can actually carry the fracture process zone. And by using this concept, now the SPS methods, which uh, the SPS method can be used to model fracture problem. Uh, if we're assuming that each SPS particle carry its own uh, fracture plane and orientation, like what we discussed here, okay? So how does it work here? What we're doing here is for this fracturing problem, what we can do is we can actually reinforce, re simplify our two scale constant modeling approach. This is the, the generic double scale constant model with a, a finite thickness. When it's moving to the fracture problem, this finite thickness can be approach zero, right? And by using this, by imposing this condition, we actually obtain a very simple concept model, like what you can see from here. This is the relationship between the stress and the strain or displacement term across the fracture process zone here. And the concept model now are actually featuring the size of the RVE or the size of the SP particle, right? So we no longer require this sort of the seven thickness for fracturing problem, okay? So what we need to do here is this concept model require the displacement term and the displacement term actually can be calculated from this sort of the equation, which means that we are required a quasi-fracture model, right? 
which is a very conventional coincidence fracture model. Coincidence fracture model is a kind of the, the model that links the relationship between the traction um, across the, uh, the fracture process, process zone with the displacement term across the, um, the, the fracture process zone. So here we can, um, we can formulate the uh, coincidence model for the normal direction uh, and uh, for the shared direction, okay, uh, with either using the linear some sort of the softening process or nonlinear softening process. And we can use some sort of the, um, um, the, the um, mix most some sort of the um, use criterion to, um, to add, add a criterion for, uh, to triggering the, uh, the fracture in, the, um, uh, in, in this sort of the fracture process zone. So the good thing is that for this sort of fracturing problem, any some sort of existing uh, quasi fracture model can be implemented in this framework that we presented previously. This framework here are basically um, readily to accommodate any existing quasi fracture model. And if you are interested in quasi fracture model, you can refer to some of the work that we are uh, we are developed previously uh, for the discrete element method, and it has been uh, implemented in a sphere to model fracturing problem. So I'm not going to do detail, but I'm going to show you some sort of application to demonstrate the capability of this this approach within the SPS methods. Now, what we're doing here is we're actually modeling this um, problem with SPS. And keep in mind now that this hash for fracture problem are actually approaching zero, okay? So for this case here, we're using a, a, a two-scale model with embedded fracture processor uh, for each SPS particle. And then we conduct a test. Basically, this is a test, pooling test, and trying to see how the model responds. And here is the results for uh, SPS simulation um, for the pooling test. And this result are actually compared again analytical solution for different uh, particle resolution, which is the distance between these two uh, particles. And this is the 1D solution. And we also conduct a test for 2D condition that you can see from here, um, which is uh, uh, again, we can see that our solution here are actually consistent regardless of the, uh, the, 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 the distance between, between particle, or in other words, the model here can actually produce the mass independent solution, okay? And this can either actually a potential or linear function can be used to, 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 to um, can be adopted in the, in the current approach. So this is quite a simple test. Now we're actually moving further to actually predict more complicated tests. For example, here, what we're doing here is we're actually predicting the three point bending test, right? For three different spacements with different sizes, okay? This is large size and then reduce in the size. Uh, and this work was conducted by uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Jing Nang, and published in um, IJD Chuno. And this is the result predicted by, by SPS. And you can see that here, the uh, computational model actually can predict um, the behavior of particles with different sizes, right? And then when you're actually changing the, uh, the mesh size that you to, to actually discretize this beam, you obtain more or less similar results. So the results are quite consistent, right? Telling you that this sort of currency model have to actually remove the mess or, uh, or discretization by us. And this is the, uh, the, 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 the fracture pattern that we can obtain from, from the SPS simulation. And this is the, how the fracture develops into a damaged, um, damaged um, um, variable, right? And keep in mind that this is only mode one uh, fracture, right? How about a, a more complicated mode, for example, mid mode fracture? So we also actually trying to using the methods to um, uh, predict a more complicated problem. For example, here, we are trying to simulate um, the test conducted by Lim uh, in 1994, in which he actually uh, conduct a series of the semicircular bending tests on soft rock. Okay, so in this test, he having the semicircular um, this like this, and then he having a notch, right, which is this one here, the notch, and the notch angle will change, right, like what you can see from here. And then he applied the load on the on the top surface, right, and then he measuring the force, the force acting on on the on the loading roller, as well as how actually the fracture develop uh, from from here. Okay. Now, this is the parameter uh, reported in his, um, his paper, 
some other parameter was not uh, reported, so we have to figure out uh, our, our, our calibrate our parameter based on this data. So this is the data presented in the paper. So basically, he's saying that when you're changing the angle of the notch, okay, you're seeing different fracture pattern. He said this is a fracture pattern, right? Different fracture pattern. And then based on the force that you measure from here, they can also calculate what they call fracture toughness in mode one and mode two. And then he will able to come up with this some sort of the relationship between uh, fracture toughness, mode one and mode two fracture toughness. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to predict this experiment and see whether we can actually reproduce this relationship or not using our new uh, computational framework. So here is what we did. Now, if you're looking at this is the, the SPS discretization of the semi-scalar panning test. And here we have the roller and we apply the load from here and using the Bowery particle. And this is the... Um, Sorry, this is the, 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 the fracture process, right? You can see that when you're changing the node angle, you can see that the model can predict very well how to the fracture develop inside the spaceman. And this is the, the progress which was plot in terms of the damage variable, zero mean non damage and one mean fully damaged. And you can see that very, the, the, the fracture process, the progression of fracture process can be nicely captured by, by this approach here. And when we actually compare our uh, computational solution with experiments, uh, you can see that this is the experimental results for mode one fracture and then mid most. And you can see that our solution actually fit, fit, uh, fitting very well with the experimental data as you can see from here. And not only the fracture pattern, but also the load displacement, the force acting on, on the top surface here can also well capture by, by the SPS methods. We're falling within the range of the experimental reported data. And our numerical result is also reproduce the, um, the, the relationship between the um, fracture uh, toughness. We're showing that this approach is quite robust. And the good thing of this one is all we need to do here is we need to changing um, the coercive model for different type of material. Here we're looking at a soft rock, but you can just try changing the coercive model to get different type of the, of the material. We also actually testing the model for more complicated problem. And it, in this case, we're actually looking at the um, Brazilian ring test uh, of rock sample. So what we're trying to do here is we actually having the Brazilian ring with different diameter, with different inside diameter here, changing from a small to, to large, right? And then we actually compress the, uh, the Brazilian test from the, the top surface. And then we compare our data with the experiments. And again, this work was conducted by Jinang, my former PhD student. And you can see here that we can more or less capture very well this of complex fracture pattern um, developed in the experiment, right? Very, very nicely capture um, consistently how the fracture developed. And in terms of load displacement, we can also capture the big load that actually uh, obtained from, from the experiments. We're showing that our model having a very good capability of capturing fracture problem, okay? So that is the, the uh, what I have presented so far is the uh, static problem, right? Static problem, but how about dynamic problem? You know that for rock problem or for rock, dynamic are very important because most of rock material are strongly dependent on, on loading rate. For example, if you're looking at the uh, this experimental data here, you see very clear that the dynamics uh, strain of the rope are strongly dependent on the strain loading rate or the loading rate, right? So how we actually using the SPS model to capture dynamic behavior. So what we can do from here is, um, what we can do from here is we can actually further extend the method. Oh, we need to, uh, to give me a few minutes. I need to mute this, uh, this student uh, just to make sure. Or maybe John Peng, can you help mute him? Hello, Professor Bui. I, I'm not the host. I cannot do that. But I can. I think you have a setting that to mute all, all, all of them. And uh, the people who are in this uh, lecture, can you please uh, switch off the, the audio? 
Can somebody have to uh, to unmute uh, the background noise, please? No, Professor Pui, I'm not the host. I cannot do it. Yeah, I think I can do that, but somebody actually, I will not be able to mute them. Because I don't know where, who is that? I will not be able to mute them, actually. I need to find who is actually. So, yeah. Yeah, somebody here. Uh, Professor Weigu, are you there? I think it looks like the noise comes from yours. All right. Yeah, I will check that. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll, I think I mute, I mute all. Uh, I'll continue my, uh, my presentation. <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? I will check that. All right, then I'll stop. All right. Yes. Yeah, just go. Now, yes. Just yeah, go. Thank on. you. Thank you. Yeah. Just yeah, go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we're doing here is um, so I'm talking about the dynamics problem. So we know that here um, the rope actually have inherent some sort up to the loading rate, and we can see from this experimental data that the shear string or the dynamic string of rope are significantly depending on on the loading rate where upon a certain some sort of loading day, the string are significantly increased. So what, are we, what can we do with SPA to capturing this problem? Um, well, of course, we're having a different methodology to, to capturing this rate dependent problem. But one of the most simplest way, which is the very traditional way, even though I'm not actually lining that up course, but what, what I can show you here is what we can do with, it, with, with the current two scale model. Now, the simplest way to do is we're still adopting exactly the same um, um, two scale constant model, but changing the uh, coercive model, take into account the rate dependent behavior. It's very simple. Which means you only need to reformulate the coercive model to take into account the rate dependent behavior. The rest of the constant model remain unchanged. All right. So if you're doing this, you will able to capture very nice and sort of the rate, rate dependent behavior. For example. This is the, the SP prediction of dynamic problem, or dynamic fracture problem, again, um, uh, was conducted by my former PhD student. So what we're doing here is we're trying to simulate the experimental data by, uh, by Chon and Charles in 1990, a very long time. Back. They conducted a three-point test, point, three point bending test under both static uh, and dynamic loading condition. And what they're doing here is they're having the nodes at this location, and they're having the parameter gamma, <clears throat> to control the, this, the place or the location of the nodes. And they apply the load at this location, okay? So they found that under the static loading condition, a quasi-static loading condition, they see that the failure, the transition failure most occur at the gamma equal to 0.7, all right? This, when this gamma equal to 0.7, you start seeing the transition mode when they start from inclined to the vertical, right? But for the dynamic load, right, the chances in failure mode occur at uh, later when gamma is actually equal to 0.76, right? And you can see before that, you actually seeing this inclined failure. And after that, you see vertical failure. So this sort of challenging that we want to capture by SP to see whether our model can capture this sort of chances in failure mode or not. So what we're doing here is, again, we're using the SPS methods uh, with the with a two scale model uh, for it, in which is SPS particle uh, actually processing a fracture process zone. And we was able to obtain a quite consistent result in terms of mass dependent that I presented before, so I'm not going to present it here. So what I see here is for static loading, we was able to obtain um, relatively good agreement with the experiments, and we was able to capture uh, exactly um, the, uh, the, 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 the results of the when the failure mode transition occur. So in our simulation, when the gamma equal to 0.7, we actually seeing the transition from inclined to vertical failure mode. Okay, this is the, and this is the result that, that you can see from, uh, from simulation. And this is how actually fracture develop in the, in the model. With gamma equal to 0.5, you see the inclined, um, 
you know, fracture and with gamma equal to 7.7, you see the vertical fracture. <coughs> and this is static, right? This is static loading. Now let's move into the, uh, to the dynamic load. So when we actually move into dynamic load, uh, where we apply the load degree of, of 0.5, uh, so of the strain rate, and you can see very clear that when actually gamma less than um, 0.76, we consistently obtain the incline failure mode in our simulation. And when gamma actually reaching 0.76, um, we start obtaining uh, the, the, the vertical failure mode. And this is quite interesting results. So this is in terms of dynamic failure. We can also actually, and this is how the fracture develops um, in the in the spacement under dynamic loading condition. And we can also actually capture how the fracture propagates in the, in the equipment. For example, in this case here, um, we actually, this is the experimental data reported by Zhang and Zhao uh, for the split Hopkinson bar, okay? So what they do here is they're having a, a spacement. This is the, Brazilian, um, yeah, the, the semicircular um, disk spaceman, and they, they play the spaceman here, all right, within this sort of the uh, transmission bar, and then they apply the wave to this location, and then they're using the camera to measure how the fracture develops, and this is the, 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 the propagation of fracture with times that they may measure from the experiment, right? This is how the fracture propagates with time, and this is the um, the digital sort of the image analysis showing how the fracture develop. And we, this is a very challenging test because we need to actually capture uh, the propagation of fracture with hands. So let's see how we actually capturing this problem. So we actually replicated this simulation in a, in a SPS. And this is the, the SPS setup uh, condition and we apply the loading on the, on the top surface, right? And this is the experimental data. And you can see, you may not be able to see clear, but this is the, uh, the propagation of fracture, right? This is a propagation of fracture in the experiment somewhere somewhere here, right? And this is our SP prediction. And you can see that here, if you actually looking at the, uh, the results, we was able to capture quite nice the result, except that we actually delay a little bit compared to the experiment. And this may be, uh, we need to investigate this a little bit more, but um, the experimental data are also very sensitive when you're looking at a microsecond. So this delay actually basically nothing. But if you actually um, ignore this delay, you can see that our model can perfectly capture this sort of the development of the, of the uh, practice that observed in the experiment, right? And here is the measurement of the fracture uh, thickness uh, compared to dynamic fracture thickness, and our model was able to capture very well this sort of the, the problem. And you can see now that this very challenging problem can be nicely captured by SPS with a very simple um, uh, cohesive fracture model embedded in our two scale framework. Okay, so this is the key idea. And then the last application of the, the fracture is the, the another very complicated problem where we are trying to model soil cracking problem. And this is another very challenging application. So here, what we did was, first, we actually trying to simulate the direct set test on the clay soil specimen. This is a clay soil, right? And this test was conducted uh, in our lab. And then we compare our solution with the, with the experimental data. And you can see very nice here that when you're actually changing the mass resolution, you obtain very consistent result, right? This is not easy to obtain this sort of a consistent result using the traditional approach, all right? So this is the first uh, test, which actually quite straightforward because you're only dealing with uh, the fracture along this plane. Now, based on this, we're further expanding our model to simulate a more complicated test. For example, in this case here, we try to simulate the string cage in due fracture, right? So this was conducted by one of my uh, former PhD student, Hyoshan, um, and it was public in computer and geotechnics. In this case, we actually impose the string case strain, um, volumetric strain to the soil spaceman and see how the fracture density actually change with different thickness of the soil spaceman. This thickness here changes. And obviously, when you increase the thickness, the density of fracture or crack actually reduces as compared to when you have the thin uh, spaceman. And we was able to Qualitatively capture this sort of the um, the variation or uh, 
the reduction of the uh, of the uh, fracture density when you increase the, um, the, the, the thickness. And most importantly, uh, to me, is perhaps one of the most challenging problem is to looking at the mass independent problem for this problem, for this application. So what we're doing here is for the same simulation, what's going to happen if you actually changing the mass resolution? So you can see from here that we're having four different mass resolution and we obtain very more or less consistent some sort of the uh, fracture pattern in the experiments, right? Uh, in, in the simulation, which is not easy for, for standard numerical methods, right? So this is actually another, some sort of the uh, advanced feature of the two scale constant model. And finally, we are further expanding the methods to model another complicated um, fracture problem, which actually involves the uh, multiple fracture network. And this is again, uh, the experimental data conducted in the using the circular disk. And here from left to right is the increase in the thickness of the, of the soil spacement. And you can see that when you have the thin clay soil, you have more fracture, right? But when you have a thick sort of the uh, um, layer, you have less fracture. So in our simulation, this is the thin one and this is the thick one, right? The increase in the thickness. We was able to quant qualitatively, qualitatively capture the fracture density that developed in the in the in, in the in the uh, in the spacement. And this is the, how the fracture actually uh, developed in the in the simulation. And, and this method plus with SPS allow the natural capture of fracture without any specific treatment. So with this, this is the, the end of my uh, second application. Um, let's see how long we have. Uh, I think I have, uh, oh, I have another 30 minutes. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you the last application. So, so far I have shown you the, uh, the capability of SPS uh, in relation to soil structure interaction and the localized failure and in particular fracturing problem. Now I'm going to show you another challenging problem that related to a couple hydromechanical problem where we need to work with the multi-physics, okay? So this is the, the something we're going to, I'm going to show you. Now, so how do we act? Why do we need this sort of the, the SPS model? Now, I believe that if you are dealing with the couple hydromechanical problem, uh, if you're dealing with the problem like shipage flows or embankment stability analysis, you don't need to use advanced numerical methods, like point bay methods, right? Limit algorithm methods or finite element methods are enough to actually help you to dealing or to predicting this sort of problem. We, what we want is we want to go further to predict the entire failure process, right? And to model, for example, internal erosion causing by um, the shipage flow, where uh, the shipage flow actually carry the five particle away and leaving some sort of space inside the embankment. This is where we need some sort of advanced numerical methods. So why do, how do we actually doing this? So to model this sort of the multi-phase problem or couple problem, what we can do is we can start by using the multi-phase mixture theory, right? So this is the general framework. This is nothing new, but actually the multi-phase mixture theory. So we're looking at, at the, at the uh, representative volume elements of an uncharted soil, okay, which basically consists of three phase, solids, liquids, gas, all right? And assuming that if you don't have the air and water, it's dissolved in the water or water is thrown into air, then these three components can be actually represented or modeled by a three sort of homogeneous phase, each of which here occupy the same volume of the, of the IBE, right? So here you have the water, air, and solid phase the homogeneous phase. And from here, what you can do is you need to define what we call the, the um, partial density for each of these homogeneous phases. So we have the density, a uh, total density here are uh, equal to the sum of the, uh, the partial density. And you have the also need to define the relationship between um, water and air, we can be linked through a degree of saturation. And then you also need to define the uh, partial stress where the Newton's um, uh, Cauchy stress apply here with the total stress, actually the sum of three components, uh, which each of the component uh, of partial stress can be defined using this relation. And finally, 
it's very important to keep in mind that when you're actually using this uh, homogenization techniques, you need to keep in mind the material derivative because when you actually establish the governing equation for each phase, you actually establish on this particular framework. So when you combine them together, you need to actually take into account the interaction among phases. That's where the material derivative are play a very important role, okay? So this is the very standard approach, which is the multi-frame mixture theory. What I'm going to show here is how we actually are solving this of multi-frame mixture theory by SPS. Now, what we have is, this is the, uh, the, uh, the general multi-frame mixture theory, which basically consists of the mass balance equation for each phases, momentum equ balance equation to describe the motion uh, or deformation of each phases, and a concept relation. For concept relation here, you would need um, the concept relation for mechanical component and also concept relation for hybrid components. But I'm not going to the detail of this, all right? Now, what you're going to do is, depending on how we're solving this governing equation, we're going to have different version of SPS, right? For example, the governing equation can be shown using what they call one, either one layer SPS particle or multiple layer SPS particle, right? So for example, if you're talking about one layer SPS particle, so basically if you're dealing with two phase program, then one particle actually carry the information of both soy and flush. If you're working with a three-phase system, then one SPS particle carry the information of three phases, that is soy, um, float, and, and air, okay? On the other hand, if you are working with a multiple layer, you would require two different sets of SPS particle to carry the information of each phases, okay? For example, you would require um, a single set of SPS particle to model the soy component, and another set of SPS particles to model a solid component. So each of approach having advantage and disadvantage. For example, the multi-phase approach here are good for the internal erosion and so on, but one layer approach here are good for the few scale application, okay? So I'm going to show some of our recent progress on this. I'll probably start with the, with the multiple layer here where we do focus on thing on a two-phase uh, problem uh, and using two different layer of SPS particle. So we start by establishing the governing equation of this system. So you have, again, you have the mass and momentum conservation equation written for, for each phases. And you actually having um, the interaction between two phases described through the, the CPA force. And this is a very conventional continuum mechanics, okay? And this is the, the way we model this. We having the layer of water particle to simulate um, water phase, and we have a layer of soil particle to model the soil phase. And the interaction between these two phases can be described through these CPA forces, okay? So how do we do this? With this here, we can derive the governing equation for the water phase and for the solid phase. Keep in mind that the governing equation here are written on the water layer and the solid layer, okay? Keep that in mind. And then, this equation uh, basically involves the spatial derivative, and we need to convert this equation into the SPS form, which we can do quite straightforwardly using the approach we discussed in the previous lecture or yesterday lecture. This is how we actually approximate the gradient of a function. We can simply replay here to approximate the diversion of this guy. Or this is how we actually approximate gradient of uh, or the momentum equation. We can be replay here to approximate the momentum equation for the fluid phase point for a solid phase. So this is quite straightforward and I'm not going to explain in detail. If you're interested in this, you can actually refer to our uh, previous paper or in my lecture notes, okay, in our lecture notes. Now, what I actually more focus now is to how we actually solving this equation. Solving this equation are quite tricky, okay? So what we're doing here is we start by looking at the solid phase and this is the governing equation of the solid phase, right? So this equation here can be, for solid phase, uh, it's quite straightforward because we having the uh, constant model to calculate effective stress. We need the pore water pressure um, and if all of the information are given, we can use in, uh, whatever uh, available time integration scheme like um, leaf rock and widen or the uh, predictor corrector scheme. For example, if you're using predictor, predictor corrector scheme here, first you need to predict the velocity right, by advancing velocity to the half time step. 
And then subsequently, you actually correct the velocity by further advance by another half time step. And finally, you're taking the average of this, these two sort of the value to obtain the final solution. So this is the, a very straightforward approach and I'm not going to discuss. The more tricky part actually um, is it related to the water phase, right? That where here, if you're looking at the, 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 the governing equation, you would need, what you need here, you would need the pressure, right? You need the pressure. And basically you should actually impose some sort of the constant model to calculate the water pressure. But here we don't actually using any constant model. We don't using any steep equation to calculate pressure. But instead we're going to work out the pressure through the, the, the time integration process. So what we're doing here is, is to integrate this equation. What we're doing here is we're going to use again, the two step predictor corrector scheme. So we start with a predictor. This is the governing equation that we have. And because we don't have the pore water pressure, so that's why we ignore the pore water pressure for now. So we advance the velocity here only based on the gravitational force and the CPA force. And this actually giving us this guy here. So this is the temporary velocity advanced based on the CPA force and the gravitational force. And from the temporal velocity, we can calculate the density, which is this equation, and the advanced temporal displacement. Okay, now what happening here is in this time integration, we ignore the pore water pressure. Now we need to correct this to include the pore water pressure. Now this can be done by further including the pore water pressure in the correction step. And the problem is you don't have, we don't have this pore water pressure, right? So if we don't have the pore water pressure, then how we calculate the pore water pressure? To calculate the pore water pressure here, what you can do is we can replay this equation here back to the to the continuity equation. And then we impose the condition uh, of the uh, chain in a density uh, uh, equal to zero. This will giving us what we call the pressure portion equation. This is the, a new equation to actually calculate pressure and this very well known pressure portion equation. This equation here are actually having a source of the density change and also have the coupling effects here. We take into account the deformation of the solid phase. Okay, that's a quite nice feature. Now, starting from here, solving this equation is another challenge, right? Because this equation requires some sort of implicit uh, sort of time integration scheme to solve this equation. So how do we do that? Now, if you go further from here, this equation, this pressure poison equation, actually involves the second order derivative, right? Second order derivative that needs to be discrete design in SPS, right? So in my lecture notes, I actually show you in detail how we can obtain the second order derivative. And if you're using that approach, you can straightforwardly obtain this equation. Right? So this equation can be obtained by using the second order derivative SPS operator. And if you're looking at the equation here, if you want to solve the equation, obviously you need some sort of the linear equation. So of A, P, because the pressure here are on at the present times, right? And this equation, if you actually written this equation for a system, let's say a um, thousand particles, then you would need a matrix of thousand times thousand, right? Which is heavily, uh, require heavy, heavy computational cost. So we actually don't like this uh, implicit scheme. We don't want to using any implicit scheme or we don't want to solving the linear system equation. What we're doing here is quite simple. What we're doing here is we assume that within one time step, the pressure of the of particle I are not changed that much. Of, of particle J is not changed that much, right? And if this is the case, we can actually assume that P J at T plus one actually uh, equal to the, the P P J. And from here, we can rearrange the equation to obtain this explicit solution, right? So this equation here can be obtained explicitly without solving the linear system equation. This is a quite nice feature. And I'm going to show that this explicit scheme produce the consistent result compared to the, um, the most advantage Delta SPS scheme. And at the same time, it's actually four times faster than the conventional Delta SPS scheme. Now, in conclusion, this is the procedure we're actually using to update our, um, our two-phase framework. We have a fluid phase on the left-hand side, we have a solid phase on the right-hand side. It's actually work independently, but when you actually um, 
um, uh, you actually can interact with each other using the CPA force, which is basically the same component here. This is the place where you have interaction between these two phases. And you also have the pore water pressure. This also allows you to do the interaction as well. Okay. Now, moving to the application of this framework. This is the results of the SPS simulation of dam break problem. So this is, you have an initial in terms of the, um, the embankment like this. And then you have the gauge here and immediately you remove the gauge and you see how actually the embankment and the water dam is collapsed. And on the left-hand side, we are using the explicit, keep in mind the explicit solution, okay? Explicit solution. And on the right-hand side here, we have the very standard compressible delta SPA, which is very commonly using in in the literature and this is also quite stable uh, some sort of the, the solution but the difference here is for this case on the left right hand side you actually have to assume compressible uh, flow meaning that you need a steep equation pressure at a function of, of, the, of the density but on the right hand side here we don't need a steep equation and our flow are actually incompressible and this is the, the compression between um, um, two actually solution and you can see that this sort of the scheme produce very consistent result compared to the to the Delta SP scheme. What else? Now, what you can do here is we can actually further validate our model. Uh, this is the very nice SES experimental data uh, conducted by Antonia um, in 2013 that have, we has been using in, to validate our model. So this is the rough field lab, right? And this is the parameter um, she reported in her thesis. And uh, what they did here is you actually um, supply the water uh, at the inlet here with three different flow rates, right? Three different flow rates here. And this is the, um, the diagram of the, of the experiments. Water pressure as well as the free thick line for this uh, when the water passing through the, the embankment, okay? So what we did here is we actually using the same sort of information reported in our thesis, and then we reproduce this model using the SPS. And this is the solution that we predicted. And you can see here that the solution using the explicit incompressible SPS scheme was able to remain very stable, right? Very stable with a very long some sort of physical running times. Right? We was able to simulate the flow up to um, even 400 um, seconds, which is not easy for a standard um, Delta SPS scheme. We were able to predict quite nice this sort of uh, experimental data, right? This is the um, the, 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 the pressure head measuring at this particular location in the experiments, and our model was able to capture fairly well this optimal data. We can also subsequently, we're using this model to actually predict the embankment failure, and this was the work, um, the experimental uh, data I conducted during my PhD thesis. So what I did here was I conducted an, uh, an embankment um, using the sandy material like this, and then I actually uh, supply the water on the upstream and let the water flow through the embankment. And then at some point, the internal erosion process occurs and is collapsed, causing the collapse of the entire embankment. And here we're actually using the same model set up here to, uh, to, pre to represent the, the simulation. I'm going to show this animation again. And you can see this is the slip surface obtained from experiments. And in our model here, we was able to capture the overall some sort of the failure surface in the in the experiments. Um, and the seepage flow passing through the embankment are very stable, as you can see from here. Now, if you're working on SP, looking at how particles actually distribute, you can see that our solution are very, very stable. Unlike if you're looking at some other solution, the particle tend to clump to its order, right? And this is the, the direct comparison between experiment and simulation as well as the process of how the failure actually occurred. We was able to capture qualitatively how the, the fracture, uh, how the, 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 the failure surface uh, developed. However, we was not be able to capture this sort of the discontinued surface. And this is mainly because we are actually using the double layer framework where unsearched soil was not taken into consideration. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you very quick some sort of how we actually uh, improve this solution. And this is going to the three phase SPS framework. And this has been uh, a very recent research achievement um, in, our, in our group. And um, here are a couple of PhD students who are actually working on, uh, on, it, on, it, on this framework. 
So different from the uh, previous framework, for the three-phase SPS framework here, we are actually using one SPS particle like this, one SPS particle, but carry the information of three phase. And then we're solving the three phase on a single SPS particle. Okay, this is the key idea. And I'm not going to go through the detail of this um, um, of this um, computational procedure, but I'm going to show you some results uh, which just to demonstrate the capability of the methods. Now, with this model, when you take into account the untreated soil, and this was the, uh, the excellent work done by Liang, uh, who has been uh, completing this work, and, and Srina, he now actually publishing this paper. And this is the results of the one-dimensional transition unsaturated phase flow, right? So he actually using the one-dimensional soil column, and he actually um, either actually subject to the infiltration or drying process, and he was able to capture the result with a very um, must um, capturing the analytical solution, exactly um, similar to what we observe in the analytical solution. And this is 1D, and he will also be able to capture the 2D solution, for example, like this case, um, this is the comparison between the SPS simulation for 2D condition. Um, this is quite a challenging problem. And here are a couple of the, uh, of the solution by different methods. And this is the SPS solution. And he was also be able to capture the solution with a, 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 a very random, some sort of the um, uh, particle discretization, all right? Now, for this is the all of these are actually compare again some sort of the um, analytical solution or finite element solution. So what he did further is he actually ver verify his model again the experimental data. And what we did here is we took the um, ship page uh, flow experiments conducted by Kitamura in 2004, and this is experimental setup. And what he did was actually he supplied the water, and then he set up a number of sensors inside the the slope, right? And then he actually measuring how the pore water pressure changes as the CPA flow progress, right, through the uh, the slope. And he actually present this list of parameters here. And this parameter allow us to basically calibrate our soil water character curve. Okay, so this is the, the key idea. And this is his actually uh, validation. Uh, this is his validation. And you can see, uh, let me see. You can see that he was able to capture uh, quite nice uh, the experimental data, uh, like what you can see in this particular case, uh, different actually, um, let me see. So you can see here, this result is actually represent the data at this location. So you have uh, the pore water pressure at three locations here, and he was able to quantitatively capture even when actually the water accumulation at this location. For the sensor uh, 10 to uh, 6 to 8, which is this location, it was also be able to nicely capture this sort of the, the behavior. But for this sensor here, um, this uh, three uh, five sensor at this location, somehow our solution are actually faster than, 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 than the reported equipment. And we are still figuring out what's going on at the moment, um, either because of our power condition or because of the parameter we are using in a model. Uh, but unfortunately, for this test, uh, he did not actually produce any sort of deformation pattern to validate our model, and therefore we have to use in different tests to validate our model. And this is another kind of very nice set of experimental data conducted by Sarko in 2011, where he actually produced the rainforms induced shallow slope failure. So basically, this is the, um, the, the geometry of the slope, and he actually, in, in the test, he actually apply the rainfall condition on the slope surface here. And then he actually setting up the 3D laser scanner uh, to actually measuring um, the failure pattern before and after collapse. Okay, this is quite nice. That's what I set up. Let me see, this is the, the, the experimental data. You see, this is how actually the slope collapse uh, process. And this one here, uh, the laser scanner that he reported in his paper. So this problem actually involves the couple deformation, right? Couple deformation. So to predict this sort of problem, first we need to actually validate our model for a couple deformation. So actually what we did here is, uh, um, all right, before we doing that, this is the, just the um, summary of the experimental data. This is the 3D laser scanner. This is the failure pattern that we can figure out from the 3D laser scanner. 
And here is how we actually calibrate our survey theoretic curve based on the given information. And now we actually predict first, we need to calibrate or we need to develop a model to capture uh, the couple deformation problem. And here we actually, um, Liang actually validates the, his model against the 1D consolidation, Tesi consolidation solution. And you can see that he was able to nicely capture the um, Tesi consolidation theory, okay? And now he actually using his model to first predict the pore water pressure. And this is how he actually predict the pore water pressure. Uh, again, given a limited information reported in this paper, um, keep in mind that most of the experimental modeler normally forget to giving us a, a, a data for simulation. And as a result, some of the data we have to figure out by yourself. But given this limited information, we was able to nicely capture how the pore water pressure develop, even though the numerical simulations seem to be quite delayed compared to the requirements. But the more interesting part here is when we compare again the collapse, right? This is the, the failure pattern actually obtained in the experiment. And this is how actually they monitor the collapse when it's actually happening. And we were able to capture very nice the time where the collapse occurs. And this is the overall failure mechanism which actually can predict from this the test, right? So we are actually publishing uh, this result very soon. So this is the, um, the, the, the result showing you how the water level at these three particular locations change in the simulation. You see, this is the water fund, and up to here, the water actually build up accumulation, and this is a comparison between experiment and the simulation. So he was able to capture very nice this sort of experiments using the SPS model, and I believe that um, not easy, this sort of uh, multi-phase uh, multi problem are not easy to handle using the, the other methods. So that's pretty much what I have for today's presentation. And this is the key conclusion uh, that I have. Um, so to the end, what I would conclude here is um, SPS is very robust numerical methods, right? So we can actually use to simulate a large number of challenging problems uh, and, uh, and, and, and a multi-phase, multi phase multi problem. But when it comes to model large deformation, uh, we need to actually um, make sure we're able to capture um, the, 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 the onset and port failure problem, and that's where we need to use the scale dependent currency model. Okay. And finally, um, um, we are actually having an advanced code at Monas, and if you are interested in collaborating with us, then feel free to, to contact me. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Uh, Professor Bui, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. Yes. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can yeah, hear you. We yes. hear you. We hear. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. You see, over the many many years, so your research result accumulated, and uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> from the background to to the applications and the broad coverage. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, yeah. So, any questions from the audience? So I see the number of uh, uh, people who logged into the system grew to about seven pages. So it's just, yeah, also during the lectures. Yeah. Okay, I have just, just one, ke one question. Remember that we are threatening with the lottery of selecting a name from the audience and then ask, uh, making him to ask for her. To ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I suppose the, the lottery has in mind. So uh, the question is, is regarding shallow landslides and it refers to uh, both of today and something that uh, you were showing yesterday, which was how uh, it was some sort of break, dam break problem in which there was a wall and be having behind uh, a very loose, very loose soil. And then you were showing how this, this, this very loose soil was flowing in such a way that the failure was not uh, localized at all. I mean, it is like uh, what Felix Darf used to call, I started calling it like that, diffuse failure mechanism. And then uh, I think it is quite important, this, this leak of action that may happen there, uh, both in cases, for instance, in which we have mm, this sort of mm, flumes in which uh, Iverson fumes, for instance, where you have a, a screen which is being removed and then the material is flowing 
and having poor water pressure that it has it hadn't it, it hadn't before rem the removal of the screen. Everybody is assuming, including me, that it is because of liquefaction. But then I think it is the first time I see in that the liquefaction may happen under these conditions. So I'm, I was very glad to see it. I mean, of course, I enjoyed the, the, the whole lecture. And uh, anyway, is any anything you would like to to say about that or? For the um, for the, uh, I think you are you are you are right in terms of the debris flow. Um, obviously, we are at the moment many of us, including me as well, we are actually ignoring the contribution of the poor water pressure. Uh, which is uh, which is incorrect, right? So this is something we are we are discussed um, actually with uh, with our, our collaborator in in Hong Kong when they putting the proposal. I would strongly actually recommend them to 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 come up with a um, with a fully coupled approach where we actually need to further attain this sort of the MUI revolutory model and to account for for the poor water pressure. But for what I'm presenting in in this in the in, in this test in terms of debris flow. We don't actually take into account um, the, 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 the development of water pressure. But for the last one, for the last uh, sort of slow failure uh, problem that we are simulating is actually the mechanism of suction um, induced failure. So you actually, um, um, you have in the constant model, uh, we have a strains proportional to the suctions. And when you have the seepage, some sort of the uh, infiltration to the pros media, um, the, the cohesion, um, uh, the component suction cohesion will reduce and that actually collapse. Uh, that is a different mechanism. So for the, um, for the one that's again yesterday um, with, with, the, with different constant model, again, we actually modeling the dry material. So we actually haven't looking at the fully coupled behavior yesterday. Uh, so therefore we don't actually consider this obliquid fraction behavior, but we do, I do have a, a PhD student at the moment uh, looking at uh, at the fully coupled uh, SPS to model the liquid function behavior. And this is something we're going to report uh, very soon. Okay, excellent. Many thanks. More Thank questions? Uh, you don't have a question? Oh, Christopher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah Christopher is speaking now, yeah. 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 Okay, Christopher. yeah. okay, please. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. I'm a PhD student at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, in the United Kingdom. I have three questions. One is related to the Bra Brazilian ring test, and the other two are related to the triaxial test. Uh, the one for the Brazilian ring test is uh, the fracture pattern developed from the inside of the ring. That's from the experimental pic uh, test picture you showed. Yeah. Your, your modeled fracture uh, actually developed from the outside. And why, why do so you know? We, we actually developed from inside here. If you're looking at this guy, it actually developed from inside, right? Yeah, if you look at the fourth, uh, if you look at the experimental result, the fourth one. This one here. Basically down. Yeah, this one, you mean? Yes, yes. And then just by the, yeah, just by the uh, left-hand side of it, where you have your uh, modeled result, you see there's a difference between what direction the fracture is developing towards. So you are saying here, right? This one, right? Yes. So this one here, we don't, we don't, we don't have the, we don't have experimental progress, so we don't know what's going on. But what we this is the the final failure pattern we obtained from the experiment, okay. and this is the result we predict in the simulation, and we what we seeing that is we seeing the, the the fracture actually starting develop from from somewhere here from inside, right, and then and then start develop from here, and that's where they actually opening. Yes. Okay. So we don't we don't know we don't know how actually this is a problem. We don't have the the progressive development in the experiment. So that's why we don't know actually we cannot compare this sort of progress um, of uh, progressive failure in, in, in the experiment. Yeah. Okay. Did, did you conduct the test? You said? Did you conduct the test? 
And no, 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 no. I, I wasn't the one that conducted the test. I was just curious, you know, seeing the yeah. the, the uh, results and how they compare. So I, I felt. Yeah, this is the this is the the experimental data, right? Yeah. And this is the only final failure pattern we obtained from the paper. Okay. So we don't know how actually the fracture develop in the experiment. Okay. But if you're looking at the mechanism conceptually. If you're looking at the mechanism of this guy, yeah. when you try to compress them, I believe the fracture needs to develop at this location first and then starting from here, which our result makes sense, right? Physically correct. Where when you compress the spaceman, the stress, this area should actually subtract to the, the tensile stress that where the fracture actually develop, right? Okay. So from the mechanism point of view, I don't see any problem in, in terms of numerical simulation. Uh, but I don't have the evidence uh, because uh, they don't actually reporting the progressive development in the experiment or in the paper. Is that yeah. clear? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll just move to the second question and then the third yeah. one. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think the, there was a question from uh, from Sean, Sean Guyen. So please, Sean, go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, do you hear me well? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I have a, I have a, maybe two questions. So the first question, maybe I missed something, but I, I didn't see how you, uh, how you determine the per perimeter uh, for your models with the, the localization bank. So how, how you determine the perimeter for, um, for your model? They are different between the material property outside uh, of the bank and inside of the bank. And um, and do you have a comparison between your numerical result with the experimental result at really at the, the sample scale? We do, yes. Um, I think uh, well, Yang here, Yang can Yang can uh, can comment on this later. Uh, I, I will I will um, try to do first. Now with the model parameter for the what we need to do is we we need to have the we need to measure the shear band uh, thickness, okay? And this can be measured from experiment, right? Uh, and then um, that, that is the only parameter we need for this model. And we has been successfully um, using this model to predict, the, to back analyze the track so test that I, not, uh, I did not present it in this, in, this, um, in this paper. And we do actually um, verify and calibrate on the model, uh, again, experimental data. Now, in terms of the, 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 the behavior of material inside and outside the localizing zone. My colleagues also have the experimental data which clearly show that when um, the material undergo homogeneous deformation uh, and when the localize occurs, localization occurs, we actually using the, the DIC test to conduct uh, the test on drop type sample and he did actually showing the, uh, the material outside the localizing zone actually undergoing the unloading process why the material inside the local zone undergoing the, um, the, the continuous deformation process. So we do have all of the, um, the, 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 the validation, again, experimental data, uh, but due to the limited time, I, I don't have, and also the scope of the presentation, I don't, I don't present all of the information on, on this presentation. Okay, thank you. And maybe the quick uh, second question is that um, the last application, okay, really I, I didn't see how you take into account the, the internal erosion in your model because uh, for internal erosion, you lose the solid fraction and then uh, then the, the microstructure of the soil chain. So how do how yeah. you intend to, to, to take into account this uh, phenomenon? We do have, um, I do have a PhD student um, working on this topic at the moment. And what we're doing here is we actually formulate a new concept model to describe, so when you actually, sub, the, the, the material subject to internal erosion, the grain side equation change. When the grain side equation change on the, um, the, the mechanical property of soil also change. So we're actually okay. formulating a new concept model to describe this process. And he already completed uh, this model, a very nice result uh, was obtained. Uh, and the next step is to Im implement this concept model in SPS. So in this presentation, we have not actually simulated any internal erosion process, but this is the, the next step. Okay, so 
I am an associate professor in, uh, in University of Nantes and we are looking uh, in the similar topics. So maybe later on we can uh, really Definitely. exchange the, yeah. the, the uh, exchange and maybe collaborate in the future. But really thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. I'm looking forward to collaborate with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, may I go ahead with my second question? Uh, uh, Manolo, you are the boss, yes? <laughs> no, well, I am, uh, in fact, uh, today it, it is it is uh, Prof Wu because I'm just one of the speakers. So, but anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, perhaps if we have a look, if we have other other uh, questions, maybe we we'll let them go ahead because, you know, uh, we just try to let as many people have the chance as possible. Any other questions? And if not, of course, you, you, you are reserved, you're on the, on the list. You can, can bring your second and third questions. Any other questions? Good morning, Professor Bui. I'm Elena Dodaro from University of Bologna. I'm a PhD student. And I'd like to ask a question about a couple hydromechanical problems. In particular, um, I'd like to better understand why FEM models are not as accurate as HPD method to represent an embankment collapse due to seepage flow. The, the double model, um, uh, a very simple model, which did not take into account the unsurface soil behavior. Now in the experiments, we actually representing the three phase system, but in the numerical model, we idealize the model at a two phase system. And as a result, we was not able to capture um, the, the, the accurate mechanism. And, and that's why uh, in the last application, we are uh, start attending the model uh, for three phase system that take into account the influence of air uh, and also the suction and so on. And that will allow us to have better um, uh, um, physics to capture the essence of mechanism or can observe in the experiment. Okay, thanks a lot. Another quick question. How much time do I need to run uh, an analysis of this, of this type uh, with SPH uh, um, method instead of PEM? That, that is a very nice question. It depends on, on how we actually um, looking at the problem. Now at the moment, yes, sure. We, we, um, the problem is we don't normally compare between FEM and SPS because FEM cannot simulate large information. So we, 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 if you want to compare FEM, then the question is, FEM may take only maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes, but they only, and only be able to simulate very small deformation. Now, if we, if we actually showing the same deformation range, then uh, I wouldn't see, uh, I would say that the SP may be a little bit slower than FEM, but if, if we're talking about the last deformation problem, and that different. So we need to compare again, not FEM, but compare with some, uh, methods like, for example, a uh, couple of oil Lagrangian and, and some sort of the existing uh, methods that use to model large deformation. Now, if that is the case, one of my students actually currently working using <coughs> um, the Eulerian methods uh, in available in Ambercus to model granular flows. So he actually simulating the granular flow collapse and compare, trying to actually uh, compare with SPS solution. It took him 16 hours, 16 hours to model a granular column collapse test. Why in SPS, it takes us probably 15 or 20 minutes to model a granular column collapse test. So that is the fair a big difference. Yeah, that is the fair comparison, okay? So we don't compare with FEM because FEM cannot do the work that we are doing. We need to compare with some methods that actually can reproduce the same results. And that is the really something we need to, to look at. Yes, thanks a lot for your kind answer. Well, any other questions? I think yeah, Chris, Christopher, you can you can have. Uh... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, you said the thickness of the shear band for the triaxial test, uh, you determined it from the experimental test. But well, I wanted to ask, how do you decide the particles to have the ROV constitutive model, as well as the orientation of the uh, of the band? And when the localization is initiated, considering that most uh, particle scale experiments have shown that localization develop uh, prior to the peak strength and then undergo some changes before following a single localization path. 
So what we're doing here is, um, I think I, I may have uh, present quite fast in, in the in the numerical Im implementation. What we're doing here is um, before the localization occurs, um, right? The conceived model, uh, the standard conceived model, the following the traditional elatoplastic conceived model. But then we actually using um, the um, we using the um, let me show in this. Um, we are using this um, this condition to. What we're doing is we actually um, using the um, the condition. We're using the condition uh, to um, where's the implementation here. So this is the. Can you see this line here? Yes. So this is the this is the idea. Now at the this is the entire idea of of the numerical implementation. So. At the beginnings, basically for every SPF particle here, you have the velocity, we're giving you the strain, right? Yeah. And strain actually giving you the stress, right? It is the yes. epsilon. So before the, before the localization occur, we have a one constant model. And then mm -hmm. based on the stress here, we're actually using the stress to actually checking the bifurcation condition. And this is the bifurcation condition we are, we are checking. And in this bifurcation condition here, we are checking when the products of this um, Stiebnik matrix multiplied with the orientation here uh, are less than zero. And this orientation are uh, required to rotate. So what we're doing is we, for every some sort of the SP particle, we rotate the, the orientation to see, to see at the current stress stage, do we actually having uh, any orientation that satisfy the condition or not? And if they are not satisfied the condition, then no localization occur. But if they are satisfied the condition, then localization occur, and then we actually start moving to here. So that's the key idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense now. Okay. And uh, Yang, Yang can come in further uh, if you. Yang, are you there? Uh, yes. Hi. Um, that's a good question, and um, uh, we can use the. Uh, um, dry Srutniki uh, localization tensor, and we minimize the uh, determinant of the FUC tensor to determine the orientation that uh, is uh, the orientation of the shear band. So that is, that is the uh, the one using the uh, uh, rice and Rutniki criteria. And for elastoplastic model, so we have because for elastoplastic model, unlike the hypoplasticity model, we have a range of orientation that suddenly meet the criteria that the determinant is less than zero. So we have to pick the one that minimize this yeah. Uh, yeah, determinant. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Thank you. All right, any other questions? I think there's a couple of people asking, um, Laura, Laura, uh, Bo, uh, and Chandara, and then, do we have times? I don't know. Yeah, Manolo, how about you, how about the time? You you're the next speaker. We have a. The, the only thing is that we are going. We are a little bit late in the sense that we are going to finish something like uh, one thirty, okay. <laughs> provided uh, in alert we have uh, to be back at, at three because uh, remember that we have the PhD prize and also we have the invited lecture so yeah, yeah. i mean um in my case both of the lectures i i will uh, run them or they will be run by by boku pre-recorded are 51 and 57 minutes into two parts so i can skip the the mm, the gap between both of them we can skip it and then leave the questions for for the end so i mean you you have the the two files and i, I will be around so i will be watching and and, and talking or whatever. So I mean, it, it is one question could be okay. I, I mean, I don't. I wouldn't like to be the, the nasty man. And all right, <laughs> we got. We have the last order. <laughs> Who gave the last order? Can I take the last question? Yeah, La Laura, it, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm a PhD student in uh, Norway, and I was just wondering. If you're modeling something at a field scale problem, for example, a landslide, and you need to know the thickness of the shear band, what will you use in that case? Are you going to base it on a millimeter thick shear band that you find from a triaxial lab test, or are you going to use something different? Yeah. 
So as you see from our model, the, the ticket of Severan is the input parameter for a given material. So we can actually conduct a track cell test to actually determine what is the, the typical Severan ticket for a given material. And then we can using that information for the SPS. Now we don't need a, a very fine metric solution because the concept model itself already featured this mechanism based on the given information. So we don't actually um, need any some sort of the uh, the Sherman technique in the field. We are actually talking about the material as um, uh, the material test at the laboratory scale, the Sherman technique measuring at the laboratory scale. So it could be in the order of 10 or 15 uh, particle diameter uh, for the soil. You think that's also true for a clay soil or cohesive? For clay, yeah, that's a good question. Well, we haven't actually looking at for clay, and and, and there's something we we looking at. Uh, there's a number of um, of, of the things we are looking at as well. Um, for clay, we had we had, we actually having a um, uh, we we did actually having a student capturing this behavior for clay, and we got ten quite um, quite good results. Jan, uh, Jan, can, can you remind us about that that work uh, on the on the clay? Uh, yes, he used the unsaturated model to mm -hmm. capture clay behavior and mm -hmm. the orientation of the shear band. But we have to assume a thickness because we could not get the thickness from the experiment. And all the experiments we have, they do not report anything related to shear band thickness because <laughs> this is not non-standard experiment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that, that's a very good question, and and of course, um, we can we I, work with whatever we have in experiment. <laughs> yeah. Can I have I maybe uh, to to tell you something from my take on the bifurcation? I've been there for a very long time. It's one of the conundrum. Uh, conundrum uh, in geomechanics because the multi scale is uh, is a problem. Uh, all started with a with a paper by Professor. Uh, a uh, professor in, in Cambridge, Roscoe, uh, dealing with the shear band. So there is the thickness of the shear band is primarily dependent on the grain size. So we talk about sand, granular material, right? It's about 10 to 15 times grain diameter. So that is later confirmed in a sense by a theory by Muirhaus and Vadovlakis and one of the papers in geotechnique, which shows in the theory also the thickness of the shear band is related to the green diameter, but this goes well as long as you consider granular material. But if we come to the clay, my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, we understand very later, we understand it pretty well what happens in, in sand and granular material, in the shear band and so on. But for clay, very little, right? We don't know what happens at the micro scale, what is what the forces at play and so on and so forth, and different minerals and how they interact. So there are still quite a lot to do, I think. And that's why you are there. When we are, we're not like, no longer be there, you, you guys will carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this, this, is, this is a nice thing. Um, um, the, 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 what, what also I want to comment it here is, obviously we have a limited understanding. I totally agree with you. We have very limited understanding of the, how Sheban developed in Christ. But what I also want to comment, comment it here is the concept model that we are developing here can actually capturing a range of shear band thickness. For example, we can even actually modeling the fracture problem where the thickness shear band thickness actually approaching zero. So so long as we actually can measure the shear band thickness for a given material, we should be able to use our concept model for that particular application. So this is again, we may need to discuss with some physical uh, sort of the more or less to see how they are doing that. Absolutely. All right. Uh, yeah. So let's come to an end. We have a we have a rest, Manolo, before your your lecture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Fifteen minutes again, right? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So this means we come back at about a quarter to a quarter, a quarter to twelve, right? Right. And then you, uh, we will have. I mean, you, you will have the the, the pre-recorded material, material to run it 